What's going on, guys? How's it going, guys? Episode number three. So number three, and we're going to talk about kind of the corner store of the Ashra community. Agreed. We're going to drink some coffee that we paid. Yeah, we paid for it. Again. I'm growing a beard. Who wants to look like Harry? Yeah, so I figure, you know, being a ginger is a curse. I might as well use it to my advantage. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. But which part do you agree with? All of it. <laughs> <laughs> so stay tuned, guys. All right. It should be a good one. See you guys in a bit. All right. Well, what's going on, guys? Episode three coming your way. Time flies. It does fly. Um, we wanted to kind of talk about something that's a very timely topic. Mm -hmm. uh, the McLaughlin family. And uh, I guess there we're, we we're watching kind of the last chapter of that saga. That, yeah. that I, I think in a way, no, not all of it is ever going to go away because the city wouldn't be what it is. And right. This region wouldn't be what it is without it being here. But... Uh, you know, the sad news is that, what, 150, 150. 150 years yeah. of, of history almost is coming to an end right. as we speak. Um, but um, it wasn't always like this. So no. Oshawa was this tiny little out-of-the-way town um, and up in Enniskillen, right? Yeah. There were things happening. There was a very successful little business. Back in 1869. 1869. So yeah. tell me about that. So they were building... So it really started off with Robert Sr. Robert Sr. Right, he was the one who was building sleds and carriages just so, for fun. So he was just kind of a technically minded guy. Yeah, he's a young guy too, right? Indeed. So in the summers you would build, uh, I believe it was sleds. Oh, cool. Right? And then I guess people started buying them. They're like, oh, that's cool. I want one too. Yeah. Right? And then 10 years later he goes, whoa. We're uh, growing this spot. Build it, they will come. Right? Exactly. So then, uh, like any good business, he went, you know what, well, we need to be somewhere where there's uh, financial institutions. Right. And railroad. Railroad is crucial back then. Right. So Actually, it's still crucial. It's still crucial. Right. And I guess Oshawa was this closest spot. And he said, uh, we're moving to Oshawa. And they moved not to where we see the factory today though. no they moved to uh simcoe and richmond simcoe and richmond so that would be where the regiment is where the armory is right right, in downtown right there Russia. yeah huh. uh, so that's uh that's 1879 and it's a historical spot yeah wow look at that and it burned down too are you serious yeah yeah so he moved here and i think it was nine years later so around 18 somewhere in the 1880s it burned down Fires were no joke back then. No, no, no. When you read history, it's always like, <laughs> and then it burnt down. Like, yeah. What was happening? <laughs> no, no. Hey, got short. Oh my gosh. Well, that, that's that's pretty tragic. And yeah. I don't know if there's any loss in life, but no. no. But they did lose everything from. Wow. From what I've read. Can you imagine? Though? Yeah. You remove your entire operation. Right. And then what happened was. They go, hmm, where should we go now? And all these other cities in Canada, they were giving them offers. Because so at this point, they were kind of established successful business. Yeah, and they were building carriages. They were making some good money. They're hiring people, I guess. Hiring people, that is correct. Yeah, so any town would be happy to have that in their midst. Exactly, it's a good business. And so Oshawa went, you know what, guys, if you stay, we'll give you 50,000 bucks. Remember, 50,000 bucks in 1880, whatever. Gosh, this sounds familiar. Yeah. So and there's like a 150 year history of that, too. Right. <laughs> that is true bailing them out right but you know what you can't really blame them no uh, they were bringing so much money in even back then okay on a smaller scale mm -hmm. but you know somebody had to feed the people who worked there I agree and they, had to clothe them. And they employed so, a lot too somebody had and they employed to people in the trades so, uh, you know they probably brought in people from outside the, right. the town uh, yeah so it was it was good for business all around just yeah. like it is today and the part that really stuck out uh, stuck out with Oshawa's deal was that no interest and a 20 year repayment period. Wow. Yeah. The 50 grand back then, holy cow. That's not, that's not, that's a lot of money for them, not a lot of money for us. No, compared well, 50 grand doesn't really That's not even a down payment on a house. <laughs> no, no, but no. just imagine that they mm -hmm. started an entire carriage. But at this point, they're still building horse drawn carriages. Correct. So this is still before any of this car business happens. Right, right. And Robert Sr., he had two sons, mm -hmm. and they kind of got into the game. Okay, so and both of them kind of started working it. Yeah, but in different aspects of it. Okay. Like, I think Sam was more so, uh, so Sam's the one that really made it a motor company. Mm -hmm. and he was more so the brains of the operation. Like, he would oversee it. And then the other brother, he was more hands-on. Okay. 
Right. right. So I guess he followed more in a dad's footsteps. Right. Work with right. His dad. So when he was young, he didn't really have an interest in the business, but mm -hmm. he ended up going to the U.S. Right. Uh, to go happening. exactly to go work for one of the motor companies. Yeah. And he comes back, I think in the late 1890s or early 1900s, and That's he stupid. goes, he goes, listen, Dad, we're gonna be screwed. They're building cars. We're we're building carriages. Right. They're way ahead of us. We thought we were the pioneers, but they finished carriages years ago. Yeah. Now they're building motorized vehicles. I can imagine that went over like a lead balloon because yeah. from everything I've read and, and you know history is pretty clear yeah. on this, the old guard did not like the horseless carriages. No, no, he's like, what are you talking about? No. Yeah. This is the invention of the devil. Right. And there'll be blood in the streets and. Well, the whole transition between horse-drawn carriage and the car was that people were going well. Our horse can take us home when we're drunk. Yeah, that's true. You can't drive yourself home when you're drunk, right? Can you imagine that that was an actual, like, uh, that was a problem. consideration? <laughs> yeah. I mean, now we're going, okay, this car will drive 150 kilometers right. an hour safely on a highway. Back then, those cars didn't go very much faster than the horses, and a horse could obviously do it by itself without running off the road. Exactly. Because they're a smart critter. Right. And uh, probably smarter than uh, we are in a lot of ways. Yeah, for sure. Because they're not drunk. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the son comes back, he says that um, they kind of become a motor company. They move away from the carriage company to a motor company in 1908, I think. So the son eventually wins over. I can imagine there was Yeah, but his dad still wasn't happy. No. Right? Because they were, I think, they did 25,000 carriages a year. And this is like 19, early 19, like and 19. The population of Canada back then was what? I mean, not a lot. Not a lot. So I mean, right? So. I think they said 1901, they were averaging about 25,000 a year, which is a lot. That's a, that's a huge company. Yeah. That's a successful business. Right. Can you imagine now you're taking a business? It's one thing when your business fails mm -hmm. and you're about to go broke, and you're about to go, and, and you're looking for desperation mm -hmm. of let's fix this whichever way. All of a sudden, right. any port in the storm. But this guy's running a successful business. Yeah, they're doing very well. They're making a lot of money. And his set in his way kind of uh, yeah. way of thinking. Well, the, the gravy train is never going to. Well, I'm thinking if it's if it's not broke, uh, if it's not broken, why fix it? Exactly. And his kids telling him it's going to be broken. Yeah. He goes, well, it's not yet. Yeah, exactly. So wow. let's run it until it does, and then we'll figure it out. But Sam, he goes, you know what? No, we should follow the motor train. Of course. Right. So from what I've heard, they actually had uh, Buick, like whoever the VP of Buick was, okay, uh, come by, take a look. At their operation. operation yeah. And they ended up doing a deal where it was something along the lines of Buick provided the engine. Okay. And these guys kind of had the, uh, they had the body of it. Okay. Right? So it was just a plug and play. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, and the first year they only did 157 cars. So that must have been like, Pissed. I told you so. Yeah. Uh, so many times. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. No one's going to buy this. No one's going to buy this. Nobody is buying this. Yeah. I was right. Yeah. You young kids with your music. Yeah. <laughs> no, now we're in the early 1900s. Oh, okay. So, yeah. so we have like definitely not footloose music, though. No, not footloose music. So, uh, <laughs> but okay. one thing that did come out of that was they patented patented ah the fifth wheel. Oh, really? So it was something to do with like the axle rotation. Right. So the front wheels would move independent of the back wheels. Okay. And that's kind of what became okay. very big in the car industry. So. You mentioned that at some point they were actually called, here in Canada, they were called the McLaughlin Buick. Yeah, so at one point, uh, I believe it was 19, so about, uh, early on, I mm -hmm. think some people say that Buick kind of left the deal because they weren't doing enough money. Mm -hmm. Other people say Buick stayed, so it's kind of hard to figure it out exactly. Yeah. But in 1918, uh, the McLaughlin family, they kind of figured out that, you know what, we don't have a third generation. Oh, that's going to be interested in this, so they sold it to General Motors. You can see a lot the of US. These, uh, early cars at the. There's a very nice automotive museum yeah. in Oshawa. Yeah, right across the street. From, yeah. Like not across the street, but close just by. Pretty much around the corner, just on Simcoe Street, yeah. south of, of King. And uh, I know a lot of people who live here, right. driven by it a million times, don't even know that this very very interesting little museum is mm. there. It's not that small actually. No, no, and it actually has the Macaulay Buick. It has them, yeah. that, and that's why I, I, I thought I'd mention it because. Right. Uh, where else are you going to find one of those? And it's a part of uh, Canadian history and it's part of our local history. Yeah, for sure. And again, as you can tell, we're kind of big on that. <laughs> exactly. So uh, they had that deal with General Motors, 
right? And so they kind of started building cars. Uh, World War, actually, World War Two, not yet. Not yet. So we're, we're still going through. So through World War One, everything was kind of business as usual. We're, we're building cars. Yeah. So they ended up changing the name to Buick because I guess General Motors bought Buick as well. Right. Right. And so they were calling it the Buick. People didn't like it. Sales yeah. plummeted. So they went. You know what? It's called the McLaughlin Buick. And all of a sudden, the locals went, okay. Oh, that makes sense. Get behind that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Local boy, not good. Yep. Exactly. So uh, that goes on, and then World War II comes around. And, and they go, you know what? We're full fledged, willing to help. And that's a whole other chapter of this story, I guess. Yeah. And so after World War II ends, the new cars that come out, they're just called a Buick. And McLaughlin, done. And I guess that brings us more into the, uh, the the modern era. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So one thing that I kind of want to talk mm -hmm. about, I'm a huge World War II geek. That's right. kind of my favorite part of that <laughs> period in history. Um, so at this point, after World War One, they're already building cars full time. Pretty much. But they're still called the McLaughlin Buick. Mm, yeah. It, it was. It was kind of like a let's see what works kind of thing because the locals weren't okay with, well, I guess Canadians. The American car. Exactly. So they kind of had to have that Canadian influence. But by the time World War II rolls around, so 1930, the late 1930s, 1939 World War II starts, yeah. uh, this is a fairly uh, functioning, burgeoning business. It's, it's, right. It's, it's, it's kind of like they've hammered it out, they've cleaned yeah. the process, and now it's a legitimate, like there aren't any errors now. Right. And then on what the second of September or the fifth of September, nineteen thirty nine, yeah. Great Britain uh, and France declare mm -hmm. war on Germany. Right. After Germany invades Poland, and of course we are part of the Commonwealth. Right. Um. So Canada's at war now. Yeah, and what happens is that uh, when General Motors took over McLaughlin uh, Motor Company, yeah, they kept the two brothers. Oh, did they? So yeah, so Sam became. Oh. Okay. The innovator, the older brother, he okay. became president. <laughs> and his other brother became VP. Really? Right? And they were Oshawa boys. Like, they were locals, right? So they yeah. went to the Canadian government to go, We're, whatever you need, we got you. So they were patriots. Yeah. So during uh, World War II, from what I understand, they built uh, all kinds of war machinery. They were building tanks. Yeah, so I don't know like how much of it they actually built, built, mm -hmm. but they had a big role in the automotive portion of the war. Well, and, and that, that is part of, uh, part of the reason why the Allies won. Um, right. Honestly, eventually when, when uh, the war started turning in our favor, mm -hmm. we showed up with, with trucks and tanks and, right. and, uh, and just an endless stream and endless supply of them. And mm -hmm. a lot of that, the contribution to it was uh, right here in Canada. Right, I agree. And right here in Oshawa. Right here in Oshawa. Yeah. So, um, if you ever go to Costco in Oshawa, <laughs> that's where the factory used to be. Right. Well, it used to be all around Oshawa. And different they, portions of yeah, it. Yeah, they had little uh, locations all over the place, but eventually, um, I guess they arrived in that big uh, plot of land. I, I think that was in the 50s? Mm -hmm. 1950s. Yeah, and they were employing, I think at one point, this is like early actually mid to late 1900s, but they were employing like 6,000, 7,000, 8,000 people. Yeah. And then Oh, were... fun fact. Yeah. In World War II during the 40s, mm -hmm. they had uh, 7,000 employees. Really? Yeah, and 4,500 were just employees that were dealing with war vehicles. Oh, really? So like trucks, I guess tanks and all that stuff. And I'm guessing a lot of them were probably women at this point because... Uh, That's a good question. The, you know, yeah. I mean, that was a big shift in industry back then. Um, all right. So, uh, that plant played a big role in, 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 in that social aspect of history that, that, that we don't really talk about very much. Exactly. Um, I guess this kind of brings us in a roundabout way mm -hmm. um, to today. So, the General Motors plant in Oshawa mm -hmm. has been recognized as an industry leader right. um, within the General Motors family. They've consistently been the highest quality. Mm -hmm. Um, they've consistently won awards, their products were consistently some of the best in North America. Um, and 
the city of Oshawa, all the businesses around it, I mean, there are countless stores and restaurants and, and other assembly plants mm -hmm. and warehousing and, and cross dock operations and right. just in time um, delivery businesses. I mean, if you just drive down by the lake in Oshawa, you see just countless mm -hmm. um, number of companies, local companies. Mm -hmm. Well, if you look at a company like Mackey's, which is a huge name right mm -hmm. here in Oshawa, I mean, they're, they're I know they're you know originally a moving company, but they've They've got a um, a very um, close tie with with General Motors, and, mm -hmm. and, and the success of the two companies almost goes hand in hand. Right. And there are countless businesses like that. Yeah. And unfortunately, now in twenty twenty, we have a, a city in transition. Right. Um, General Motors and Oshawa was almost always in the same sentence. Right. And uh, we're kind of wondering what's going to happen. I mean, there's, there's General Motors uh, Canada headquarters are in Oshawa. Pretty much. We have them down by the lake, uh, mm -hmm. just east of uh, Harmony Road. A right. beautiful building there. And um, I don't think anybody really saw it ending. No. And you know what? It was here for, what's 100, 150 years? Four generations? Yeah. Four generations is a long time. It is a long time. Everybody knew when, when you when you came to Canada as a, as a new Canadian mm -hmm. or, or uh, from another part of Canada mm -hmm. or, or you know just being born here and growing up here, you knew that General Motors was uh, kind of the beating heart of uh, of Durham region. Right. And uh, now we're at a crossroads mm -hmm. because it's no longer there and uh, the production's ceasing. No. Um, and and the trickle down economics of it are, are very very hard to. Uh, to underestimate, because I mean, you're you're looking at, like I said, every little restaurant, coffee shop that was right. around there. I mean, uh, and and then the big companies right. and everything else that fed that. So well, if you look at any business, right, uh, when people move in, mm -hmm. right, when you're employing like seven thousand people, that's mm -hmm. no joke. No, that is a big right. So you need housing for those people, and then you need everything else. Oh, let me just mute my phone. You're a popular guy. You know, so you need. Uh, you need restaurants for them, obviously, right? So, as more people come, industry grows, business grows, and everything else grows. And now here we are, we're a full-on city. Yeah, and, and you know, it's funny because even as far as back as the, the 1980s, mm -hmm. really the only uh, name brand hotel in Durham Region was a Holiday Inn down by uh, Harmony Road and, and, uh, and the 401. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't have all the, the motel no. dates and the Marriott's and everything that we have now mm -hmm. dotting the landscape. And yeah, there were little privately owned hotels. Mm -hmm. um, but that hotel pretty much owed its entire existence to the fact that the big wigs from Detroit would come over. They would uh, stay a couple of nights, stay a couple whatever. Nights. Uh, anybody and everybody who had to come over and deal with the plant was staying in that hotel. That hotel yeah. pretty much existed because GM yeah. was And well, a bunch of the homes off of Simcoe. Mm -hmm. So when you're going down Simcoe uh, towards, uh, towards Taunton, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you now you see all those really big... The big mansions there. The execs on them. Yeah, and the, those, were, those were the GM guys. Yeah, and then Parkwood Estates. Yeah. It was a McLaughlin family. Yeah. So Sam and his wife. And uh, they, they, even when the plant leaves, the foot, the, the, the fingerprints of the McLaughlin family are going to still be all over this mm -hmm. place. They were, they were philanthropists. They donated yeah. to the arts. They built it's, uh, community facilities. And it's kind of unfortunate after, and I get it, it's business. Yeah. But after General Motors kind of bought them out, mm -hmm. they kind of erased their existence in a way, right? Because yeah, we call it General Motors and we think about General Motors as an automotive industry, but yeah. really it's the McLaughlin family. Yeah, they were the ones that brought it here. To, they were the ones that, that allowed General Motors to really have a place to come to. Give that opportunity. Yeah. And they started as a small carriage company out of a small home in Enniskillen yeah. in 1860. Whatever. And I can tell you one thing, whether it's a McLaughlin or any other mm -hmm. single individual, mm -hmm. if you had a family uh, who grew up in this area mm -hmm. for generations, I guarantee you that plant would not be leaving right now. No. They'd make it work because it would be a little bit more than just dollars and cents. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. unfortunately, that reality, you know, GM is a publicly traded company from the United States, mm -hmm. which 
the whole buy domestic always kind of made me laugh a little bit. I'm like, it's an American <laughs> company. Yeah. You know, the, those cars are as domestic as the Hondas that are built in, uh, in Alliston or right. Toyotas that are built in yeah. whatever, Burlington, wherever they go. Yep. So, I mean, but anyways, I digress. Uh, and they just said, no, you're just another, mm. you're just another balance sheet. And this one is, is not looking right, which is sad because like I said earlier, uh, they were always the, the leading quality uh, provider of, 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 of GM products yeah. throughout the entire GM umbrella. They and it makes you think if Sam, if Robert Samuel uh, McLaughlin didn't sell the company, where would they be today? Well, here's would the they question. be gone? Would they just be gone like so many Dissolved. other small uh, automotive businesses? Right. At that point, you still had guys building cars. Right. Like, I mean, you had Buick because the guy that started it was named Buick. Right. Uh, I mean, you had... Uh, but all, then again, Buick got bought out too. Buick got bought out. But what I'm saying is there were all these little companies right. back then um, that even in the last 50 years completely disappeared off the face of the planet. Yeah. Uh, I'd say that if I had to... If I was a betting man, I'd say that the McLaughlin Carriage Works, if they were not... Uh, affiliated with General Motors probably would have uh, fallen victim to um, kind of the amalgamation of, of, of the automotive industry. Right. No and the big that. issue becomes when these bigger companies they can produce ch uh, for less. Yeah. Well, not even produce for less, but they have the space and their budget to out price you. They do. Right. They, they will. They will beat you down. They'll sell at a loss yeah. until you're dead, and then they'll make their money. Yeah. So if you're a small company out of Oshawa. Right. It's, it's hard to stay with the market. It's kind of like doing legal battle with a huge corporation. Even yeah. if they know they're wrong, they, they don't care. They, they can start you. Yeah. They'll, they'll, they'll drag you through courts yeah. until you say, you know what, I don't have any more money. Yeah, exactly. And it's kind of the same thing in industry. And uh, it's sad because uh, on the one hand, I'm absolutely certain that if a family-owned business was still here, mm -hmm. we wouldn't be talking about General Motors leaving. No. But at the same time, would we even be talking about this right now? And another question would we be, would we even be where we are today? Would Oshawa be the city it is today? Well, because now we have the infrastructure. Right, but we have the infrastructure because, because of, of them. Exactly. exactly. And, and uh, so I'm trying the to... The GM was kind of, it was a double-edged sword. It was a double-edged sword, but I, right. I'd like to stay positive. Like, yeah. I, I want to end this episode on a positive mm -hmm. note. Um, visit the museum. Visit the museum. Have right. a look at our history. There's a lot to be proud of here. So the automotive museum, where is it exactly? It's on Simcoe Street? Street. It's and right on Simcoe Street. It's, it's, it's just south of. Uh, it's just south of King. Yeah. So take a look. Admission's pretty cheap. So it, it is it's whatever. Expensive. Right. But there are unique things there that you will literally. They actually have the McLaughlin Buick. So yeah. go see that. Uh, we'll we'll drop a link to the museum in the description below. Yeah, and, uh, there are pre there's some pretty cool pamphlets that I saw like advertising advertisements mm -hmm. for the McLaughlin car. Mm -hmm. I think it was like a thousand bucks. So we'll include that as well. Yeah, we'll have a link to that. Yeah, and guys, uh, if, you know, drop us a like. Um, drop us a subscribe. That would be wonderful. Yeah. And drop us a comment. Let us know what you think. Where yeah. where are we going now as a city as a region? Yeah. Now that General Motors is no longer here. Um, there's got to be a positive to this, but there's got to be an upside. So I agree. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, some smart people will get together and figure out a way that mm -hmm. uh, um, you know we can utilize this kind of industrial heartland that, that right. Oshawa was uh, to move forward. And the biggest thing is we need to remember where we came from, exactly. meaning we need to know the history. We need to know the history. Right? We can't just forget about the McLaughlin family just like that. Exactly. Because you know what? General Motors came and, and guess what? They went. Yeah. But the, the McLaughlins lived their entire lives. They were the pioneers. And, and the, their legacy is still here. Yeah. So on that note, we're, uh, we're going to say thank you very much for watching. Uh, thank episode you for number three. This. Episode number three. Yeah. Let us know what kind of subject matter you'd like to see in uh, right. future episodes. Um, start a dialogue. We'd love to hear from you. All right. See you guys next week. Take care.